Coming up on DTNS, scientists in Singapore make energy from shadows. Android updates roll out faster now. And Alyssa Miller is here to help us understand how to spot a deep fake and when you need to worry about them. It's the grand finale of Security Week. This is the Daily Tech News Show for Friday, July 10th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Studio Colorado, I am Shannon Morse. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And hacker and security researcher Alyssa Miller is with us. So Alyssa, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. This is uh, really exciting to be here today. Yeah, uh, capping a great security week, I think, with an excellent topic. We're going to talk about deep fakes. Uh, if you want to hear us talk about the origins of freeze-dried coffee, the rise of Sunny D, and the fall of Chips Ahoy, uh, get Good Day Internet. That's our wider show. You can become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The Lenovo Flex 5G laptop, which is the world's first 5G-enabled Windows 10 2-in-1 laptop, is now available from Lenovo and Verizon for $1,399. The laptop supports millimeter wave and sub-G gigahertz bands, but Verizon only offers millimeter wave at the moment, and that coverage not yet widespread. On July 22nd, Lenovo will launch its first gaming phone, the Lenovo Legion, that runs on a Qualcomm Snapdragon 865 Plus chip. ASUS is launching its own 865 Plus powered ROG ROG Phone 3 the same day, about three and a half hours after Lenovo. It seems rude, but uh, regulatory <laughs> filings indicated Google was working on a new Nest smart speaker and everybody was reporting it. So Google sent the Verge an official photo of the product. No, not an announcement, just a photo. Uh, the forthcoming Nest has a form factor somewhere between the Nest Mini and the larger Google Home Max with a vertical orientation option. Google also did share a teaser video, uh, but has not yet released a price or release date. Apple released a public beta version of iOS 14 on Thursday, including a redesigned home screen, widgets, a new app library, improvements to Siri, picture-in-picture -picture capability, all stuff that was announced at WWDC last month. iOS 14 features first announced there, and now you can try them out, but all reports as they are with beta software is uh, uh, expect bugginess. Gardner and IDC report that PC shipments increased in quarter two after a drop of more than 10% in Q1. Gardner saw shipments up 2.8% on the year to 64.8 million units and IDC up 11.2% to 72.3 million. Both firms showed HP with the biggest growth, roughly tied with Lenovo for the number one spot and both agreed, uh, and both agreed Dell shipments fell. The French Parliament unanimously agreed this week to require nationwide age verification if you want to visit a pornography website from within France. The amendment to France's law on domestic violence leaves verification mechanisms up to the platforms themselves. Lawmakers do suggest perhaps using credit cards or the National France Connect service. India's Zomato says that it cut losses to less than $1 million in July, and that's the lowest in years. Food delivery dropped in India in June because of the lockdown. As a result, Zomato saw lower orders and did some cost cutting. That resulted in Zomato making 27 rupees on each order compared to losing 47 rupees on each order at the same time last year. So, I don't know, one of these uh, one of these stories where a company was, uh, had some foresight. Yeah, kind of counterintuitive. All right, let's talk a little bit. Uh, it, those of you with Apple rumor allergies, you might want to skip ahead uh, five minutes or so, six minutes. Uh, but let, let's talk about the first one here, Shannon. What are we hearing from Ming-Chi Kuo? Yes. Well, TF Securities analyst Ming-Chi Kuo says his sources tell him a 13.3-inch MacBook Pro, MacBook Pro will be the first to include Apple Silicon, Apple's ARM-based chip. Kuo says that it will go into mass production in Q4. He also thinks that we will see an ARM-based MacBook Air in Q4 or the following Q1. Now, Kuo is also expecting a 16-inch and a 14-inch MacBook Pro in Q2 or Q3 of 2020. 21 with a mini LED display, also a new design. Yeah, so if you're wondering when are we going to get to see these ARM-based stuff, Apple said probably by the end of the year, so this jives with that, uh, and Quo thinks it'll be the 13.3-inch MacBook Pro. Uh, you know, the, Quo has a good record with this sort of stuff, which is why we pass it along. If you're wondering, when can I get an ARM-based Mac, it sounds like that'll be when. 
Yeah, you know, a lot of folks were sort of like, yay, cool, ARM-based, you know, Apple Silicon. And then it's like, oh, a two-year cycle? Oh, crap. I need a computer this year. I'm kind of in the camp of, I might need a new MacBook Pro this year. I happen to have a 13-inch MacBook Pro now. That's a little long in the tooth. I also am just wary of being in the first wave of anything that is, you know, beta software is one thing, but uh, a a a... A rapid change in a very expensive hardware product. I am likely to see how everybody else feels and then revisit this next year. I'm likely to ride my x86 Mac as long as it'll go. <laughs> All right. A little bit more Apple news before we move on. The information reports that Apple has reached a milestone in the development of an augmented reality headset. Semi-transparent lenses for the device have moved from prototype to trial production. The information sources said that the lens moved into engineering validation test, also known as EVT, back in May, and are being developed on a single production line at a Foxconn factory in Chengdu, China. EVT means that the design is locked and test focused to the ability to mass produce. So they are taking it seriously at this point. The lenses are estimated to be one to two years away from mass production. However, Apple also has several AR and VR projects in research. This one is supposedly the project code named N301, not the sleeker N421. Yeah, the N421 is the one people are thinking is going to look just like glasses. It's going to going to be super sleek. So it, it'll be interesting to see. But if if this is right, and the information has pretty good sources usually too, then the fact that they've gone to EVT means they're they're ready to make this. They just have to figure out how to scale it up. As somebody who previously had Google Glass, who probably still has one in my garage or something like that, um, one of the biggest concerns I have is with the sleekness that we're hearing about these rumors, uh, how are they going to make it obvious if you are doing something like recording or mm -hmm. viewing some kind of um, information on the screen that may give away personally identifying details or something like that? Like there's there's some security and privacy issues that I do worry about with these, especially when they are more sleek. So I do hope that Apple uh, implements some kind of ability to understand if you're taking photos or recording on the thing. Yeah, I mean, as somebody who's, you know, I'm, I'm kind of new to the Oculus Quest game, but it is, you know, my favorite toy uh, of, of as of the last few months. I mean, this is the sort of thing like, you can't be like out and about wearing this. This is like when you're like alone in a safe space in your garage or somewhere that's, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, it's kind of clunky and, and we're, we're going to iterate and, and get to that point. But when I, when I hear AR from Apple, it's like, well, that's mm -hmm. not this, that's whatever, you know, is something that can be helpful in a real world scenario. But if we're not even talking about a sleek glasses type thing, what are we talking about? Alyssa, what what do you think? I, I, the rumors are that this first one wouldn't have a camera on it anyway, so mm -hmm. so that would kick that can down the road. Do you have any other concerns? Well, I mean, aside from what uh, you know, Shannon already said as far as the security and privacy side, there's a safety thing here that I'm a little concerned about too. When we get to the point, if they look like glasses, and you, you've got, I'm just picturing people driving down the road, you know, getting all this information flashed at them mm -hmm. in their face while they're going 65 miles an hour down an expressway. That's the kind of thing that kind of scares me a little bit. I mean, I can tell you, it, it you know, in the car, I've got a head-up display, and I really like that. But even that can get distracting at times. The idea of as I'm driving, I'm getting you know alerts and different things like we've seen, um, you know, this restaurant's here, want to see reviews or whatever else popping up as you're going. That's I think the thing that scares me the most. Yeah, the same the same sort of technology we're building to keep the phone from doing that to you is going to be extra important when it's actually on your face. That's a really good point. Uh, Google announced that Android 10 reached 100 million devices within five months of launch. That's 28% faster than Android 9 and the fastest rollout of any version of Android yet. Google credits the boost to the introduction of generic system images in Android 9, which allows for expanded compatibility testing without adding extra work for OEMs. So that makes it faster for the OEM to push it into their channel. This also builds on Project Treble, which separated OEM and SOC, system on a chip dependencies, for the rest of the code base. That helps speed up adoption of Android 9, and that has continued to help with Android 10. Android 10 also added the ability for Google to update system and privacy components 
tickets through the Play Store. That was Project Mainline. That means they could push a security update directly to the phone through the Play Store, not have to push it to an OEM, which would then have to test it and get sign off, and then it gets delayed. So that's helping as well. More components are going to be added to that project mainline uh, in Android 11. And speaking of Android 11, which launches later this quarter, Google says seven OEMs have released Android 11 developer previews for 13 devices so far, uh, which is a little bit of a better schedule. So it looks like uh, we are looking at faster, uh, more frequent updates for Android in general, not, not just patches. It's definitely been a struggle as an Android user to make sure that you're completely up to date, especially if a vulnerability is announced within Google's operating system. So in a sense, Apple definitely has an advantage when you compare the two, um, since Google has to wait around for all the OEMs to actually release their updates. But if you're a Pixel owner, it's been great all along. And in quite a few different senses. Like that's been kind of unfair for a lot of folks who purchase, especially the the less expensive Android phones, because a lot of times those even shut off after a few years of updates. So it's not shut off technically, but shut off uh, updates that are pushed to the device. So there's a lot of concerns. I'm glad to see that they are updating so much and uh, they have so many more new uh, devices that are being updated this year. Uh, so it's it's a good turn of events. And I think a lot of that comes from that Play Store advantage that they now have. Yeah, I'm one of those privileged Pixel owners, but uh, yeah, I know that I, one of the reasons I did that was because I wanted to make sure that I had the direct updates, but it'll be good for competition to have uh, faster updates for everybody, especially with, with that update that allows the security patches to be pushed in. Alyssa, do you have any thoughts on this as well? Yeah, so uh, first of all, Pixel owner as well, um, but that's exactly why I just made the change. I was a long time Samsung person myself, and this is actually the first Pixel I've gotten, and the updates were one of the biggest things because you had the issue, it was bad enough going through the OEM with Samsung, and then you had the carrier on top of it. And that was that's the thing that drove me the most nuts, was how many times you'd get an update and the carrier, whatever they were making in terms of modifications led to performance issues and other things behind the scenes. And now try to get any type of support or anything else, you, you end up in that situation. The only way you're going to get out of it is reset the phone or install everything and you know, that's getting harder and harder to do. So I'm, I'm really liking this idea of what they're doing as far as these images. And I, I guess, you know, I, I'm looking at Android 11. I'm pretty excited about some of what they're doing there too with, with the completely separate images where they'll be able to streamline those updates a little bit better too. So fingers crossed. I love it. Um, right now, I guess I'm in a better boat because I did finally make the, the jump over to a pixel, but yeah. Uh, but but I, it'll be good for everybody to have the ecosystem get closer and closer to, to unity on release, for sure. For sure. Yay, Team Pixel. Well, <laughs> scientists at the National <laughs> University of Singapore have developed something which is called the Shadow Effect Energy Generator, or SEG, that can provide sustainable power in areas that only get partial sunlight, lights, city centers. The panels in the SEG use either gold, silver, platinum, or or tungsten, and a difference in the light intensity between areas of the panel drive electrons towards the shade, creating electricity. Test panels are about six square centimeters and they produce 0.25 volts. So you would need about 20 to power a light bulb right now. However, if they can scale up, SEG could provide an option in cities where solar panels will not work. Yeah, they've got they've got some 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 ways to go before they can turn this into an actual company and start selling this cuz you know 20 what is it uh, 20 times 6 120 square centimeters uh, that's <laughs> a pretty big big amount of panel uh to have to power a light bulb but but you know this is this is just out of the the lab so they they've got time to to scale that down and that could be huge for providing sustainable power in cities because right now yeah you can put panels up on top of a skyscraper but a skyscraper uses a lot of power so hear me out, 
and maybe they can take this invention that I have in my mind and run with it. What if they take these panels, make them semi-translucent and put them on top of windows so you still get natural light inside your your office space like in a skyscraper, but you can still take advantage of like the shadow effect energy generator. Wouldn't that be cool? I've I've seen research being done already with solar panels on this, so maybe a little closer than we might think. Um, you know, I, I would love to see it. I've been wondering for years, like, why has that not been more committed to? Because, yeah, I mean, you think about skyscrapers or any office building, the amount of glass that we have all around, if every pane of glass was generating electricity for that building, you could seriously drive down the... the I mean, I don't think you're going to power the whole building necessarily, but you'd certainly drive down their draw. Yeah, I'm, not, well, I'm looking at the gold, silver, platinum. I'm like, which one of these can you hammer thin enough that it would, you know, <laughs> it would be a little bit translucent, right? I mean, half of the the buildings kind of – your idea, Shannon – yeah, if you can just figure out how to, half of the buildings already have some sort of coating anyway, so you're not like directly mm -hmm. hit by the sun, you know, if you're going to sit right. there at your desk all day, if it somehow works as like UV protection and also power generation, then you really get a product. Okay, scientists, get on it. Do it. Right? <laughs> well, we all week, uh, all week we've been we're talking about TikTok, uh, lots of TikTok stories this week. So we'll try to kind of culminate this into what we know now. TikTok has pulled its app down in India, Hong Kong as well. India banned the app and its army required personnel to delete the app from their phones. The U.S. has made some noises about trying to get TikTok banned as well, to the point that Amazon today asked employees to delete TikTok from any phone they might have that also accesses their work email because of security risks. Some of this is due to the fact that TikTok is owned by ByteDance. ByteDance is legally a Cayman Islands company, but its headquarters is in Beijing, China. The Wall Street Journal reports that ByteDance is considering changing its corporate structure, possibly forming a separate board and headquarters for TikTok outside of China. TikTok CEO Kevin Mayer, who is also the parent company's COO, has his office in Santa Monica, California. The USA. TikTok also says it doesn't store any data in China, has never been asked by China for any data, and would refuse such a request if it got one. Yeah, so TikTok was Musical.ly. Musical.ly was a Shanghai company, but it had offices in Santa Monica because it wanted to, to be able to reach out to record companies in the United States. Uh, and so it was very U.S. focused. ByteDance's Douyin app was, they have Tao Chao and a few other things, but that was their version of TikTok. So when ByteDance bought Musical.ly uh, and then they made TikTok, they had TikTok in the rest of the world and Douyin still in China. So it would be easy enough for them to say, well, we've got our CEO of TikTok in Santa Monica. Let's just make Santa Monica the headquarters. I'm not saying they would make Santa Monica. They could pick anywhere in the U.S., but he's already there, right? So you make that your headquarters. You are already a Cayman Islands company, so you reorganize TikTok as a wholly owned subsidiary that is now outside of Chinese control. Just arrest all of these concerns about China having influence. This is something TikTok could do that, say, a Huawei definitely cannot. Even if you do that, though, you are not addressing why Amazon asked their employees to delete it from any phone because it doesn't you you don't have to be spying for the Chinese government to be spying and there has been a lot of concern about how TikTok uses data just for itself just for advertising and the fact that you know we talked previously on DTNS about how they were checking your clipboard over and over and over which they said was for spam mitigation but was a pretty old fashioned and clunky way uh, to do spam mitigation so I, I, Alyssa I'm, I'm particularly curious what you think of TikTok um so yeah I, I'm sure some of you have seen the the thread that was on Reddit about this and a researcher who kind of picked this thing apart and, and did a lot of reverse engineering with it. I think what scares me the most, you know, first of all, so I've had conversations with consumers who are like, well, everybody takes our data, everybody's looking at it. And I don't think people realize the amount of data, even over and above what some of the more popular apps like Facebook and whatever are taking that people always reference. But what scares me more was what this researcher found in terms of the protections that were rolled out in this app to prevent people from being able to reverse engineer it and see what it was collecting. Mm -hmm. Where literally it, it changes the app behavior if it detects that it's in a sandbox and 
they're rolling their own um, encryption, which is scary. And the, they're changing keys every couple of weeks. It's, I, that's what scares me even more is it's like, hey, now you're not just taking a ton of data that I can't figure out why you need it, but you won't even let researchers dig into your app to even discover it. And so when you, it, it's kind of like, I think back to the movie Sneakers and the toy factory with all the wire fencing around and everything else. Like, that's no toy factory. Why do you, what are you <laughs> protecting that hard that you're that worried about it? It's more than a toy factory. Yeah. Strong encryption with uh, switched out keys is great if you're protecting me, not if you're protecting from me, the user. I don't, I don't like that. No. Uh, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. All right, deep fakes. Uh, we've talked about them a lot. In fact, we recently talked uh, about technology that would uh, was being marketed to film companies to say, uh, take a person's face and swap it in on another actor so that, that you could do some cool effects in movies. Uh, let's talk about what a deep fake is. Is it just a video or, or how, how should we use deep fakes versus just using machine learning to, to do something like movie effects? So, I mean, wouldn't it be great if there was a definition? Um, I, <laughs> there isn't that I've found. Um, I think the kind of the commonly accepted thing is it's any artificial media that you create using deep neural networks. I mean, that's where the name came from. So we've seen the technology that's used to create deep fakes. Most people think of the videos, but that same technology is used to create uh, just still images. We're creating pictures of people who don't exist mm -hmm. um, and, and from nothing, like literally just hand this this GAN, which we can maybe talk about later, but uh, you'll give this neural network nothing to work with, just a bunch of static, and it formulates and creates a, an image of a human being out of that, and a very believable image. Um, we've also seen audio being generated. There's a number of different apps out there, a number of different vendors that are offering services around this. Um, Overdub is a great one that will create defaked audio of your own voice if you just pass it some text. Which is great for editing podcasts, but you know, obviously, it could <laughs> cause concerns and other uses. Uh, and and it doesn't have to be advanced technology. We talk a lot, like you said, about GANs and machine learning. Uh, but deepfakes don't have to be high tech, do they? No, not at all. And that's this is this this is where you start to wonder how much of is deepfake really a concern because we've seen things that weren't deepfake. Just you know, it's misinformation, right? We've seen examples of this in the political space here in the United States. You think about uh, last year, this video of Nancy Pelosi that someone put out there purporting that she was drunk. And you know it, it flew all across the internet. It got shared everywhere. And I mean, that was just, they took the video and they slowed it down to 75% speed. Yeah. And so even after it was announced and it was well publicized, people were still sharing it, believing it was true. Well, and isn't that kind of the point is that it's not we we're scared by the idea of like, oh, somebody can fake something and no one will be able to tell it's fake. But isn't it more about the perceptions that we bring into it and what we want to believe? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a lot of it. When you look at what disinformation does, it plays off of your prejudices. It plays off of your predisposed biases. It basically, it speaks to things you already want to believe anyway. And so when you see it, even if it's maybe questionable, your internal biases, you bypass all those warning signs that, hey, this is a fake video, and you just become enraged or you become emotional about it and you latch onto that. And that's what makes it so difficult. I think deep fakes just, they take it to another level because they do take away even some of those warning signs that someone who would think about it more logically or the person who might seek to debunk that misinformation, it makes it harder for them. But as far as the public perception, it really, it, it, it's not much more of a threat than what we already have today. And I, I think another thing that, that, uh, that we can touch on is the fact that it doesn't even have to fool you to be a problem. I mean, something uh, that we should be concerned about is revenge porn. Yeah. So, and that's, that's one of those that's really terrifying to me because you think about revenge porn where somebody shares naked images, naked video, or makes a naked video with a partner. They break up. That partner shares it to the world. And you know, it, it, that's kind of terrifying that now they don't even have to create that video. But what scares me even more is that the, one of the common approaches when that happens 
to trying to repair some of that damage, at least get the videos removed from common sites, is to leverage the, the DCMA and a DCMA takedown request and say, hey, this is copyright material not owned by this person. You know, the copyright owner says take it down. Well, now with a deep fake, you're in this really nebulous region of who actually owns the copyright on that because it's not the video owned by the person who's purportedly appearing in it. Instead, it's video something else. And where is that line between privacy and mm -hmm. First Amendment rights? And there's just a, a whole it, host of challenges there. That's that's so insidious because I could see a fair use defense of, you know, I'm only using a very small part of a person's image in this deep fake and the harms are not copyright in that case, right? right? Uh, are, are there other things we should be concerned about with deep fakes? Um, I, th I think in general, just understanding um, some of the ability to, first of all, detect them. And I'm, I'm glad that there's a lot of research happening there. I think what's going to get a little more scary is as it becomes more real time and people can start to create things like there's there's a great video out there. One of the newer plugins that works with a number of different uh, video conferencing packages is called Avatarify. And they made a video where they, they started up this meeting and it was two people on this meeting and suddenly Elon Musk joins the call. And, you know, the one person knew it was happening. It was in with this other person who joined using his plugin to make himself look like Elon Musk. But this other woman who's on the call had no idea what was going on and thought Elon Musk had literally just, you know, Zoom bombed them and was here talking with them. Um, so I think as it becomes more real time like that and the real time becomes more convincing, that's where you might see some things like that that now expand maybe more into the business world where the threats we've there's been a lot of talk kind of ad nauseum how deep fakes could affect political discourse but i think there's a lot of you, you mentioned deep or you mentioned uh porn before and uh, revenge porn before i think on the business side there are some real potential areas where this type of disinformation could be used just you know for even um, you know, manipulating markets and things of that nature, and so that's something I think it's important that we don't lose sight of. Um, again, it's still just disinformation, but it is very convincing disinformation. And in those realms where you've got investors who might be a little more uh, versed in scrutinizing that type of material. Yeah, if you fool them still, now that's where having something so convincing could be more problematic. It reminds me of the talk we had with Stephanie on Monday about social engineering, to be honest, which is deep fakes aren't like going to fool 100% of people, but under the right conditions, just like social engineering fools you into giving over your information, uh, deep fakes are just another one of those tools to fool you in the right situation. Yeah, and, and we've had a claim of that already. Um, 2019, there was a a company in the UK where the uh, president of this energy company transferred uh, 2 million some odd euros to attackers. And later they claimed that it was because attackers had used a deep fake video or uh, audio of the president of the parent company instructing him to make this transfer. So, you know, I know some people dispute whether that's real or not. Um, obviously, I don't know that we'll ever know for sure if that's exactly what happened. But that's where we see potential threat, especially thinking about that in a, a business context. Yeah, it seems like we just we just need to get better at identifying, being able to be on guard and be be aware that deepfakes are out there. Yeah, you need to be aware that they exist. And honestly, when you think about what deepfakes are doing, is they're they're just they're continuing a cycle where we see uh, what we leverage as kind of the gold standard of evidence, if you will. It, it constantly shifts. If you think about it from a law perspective, you know, back in a courtroom many, many years ago, the gold standard was eyewitness testimony. Well, then we figured out you couldn't trust eyewitness testimony. Mm -hmm. Then we had video, and video was like this gold standard. Well, now video is starting to become less trustworthy. So the question becomes, what next or how do we you know how do we still continue to make sure that we've we've got something that gives us an acceptable level of evidence to understand the things that are going on around us 
Well, uh, hopefully we this will help people be thinking about that and, and get on guard and, and start to be able to learn how to look for this sort of stuff and not be fooled. Yeah, I mean, that's the first uh, step to fighting disinformation is just letting people know that it's out there and what it looks like. Well, hopefully everybody in our Discord is joining the good fight to fight disinformation. We already know that you are. But you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS and join the conversation. What's in the mailbag, Sarah? Oh, Tom, I'm glad you asked. Erwan uh, wrote in about a story we had a few days ago about Uber Eats uh, expanding into different markets. Uh, Erwan says, I've been living in Sao Paulo, Brazil, for about a year, and I'm quite happy to see Uber Eats starting grocery delivery, although it might be tough for them to go against Rappi, which is the main competitor with iFood. The difference is Rappi delivers everything from the food to the groceries, but electronics or beauty products, even cash... If they don't have it, you can ask the delivery person to go to a particular shop and pick up a product for you. On top of that, they have a subscription of uh, $29.99 Real, which is about $5.50 per month, that gives you free delivery for every order about uh, Real $30, 30 Real rather. So I'm happy to see that Uber Eats is getting more options because more competition is always welcome, but I fear it's not gonna be that easy for them, even with all the money that they can afford to lose. Right now in Sao Paulo, they have a pet shop. They don't have a supermarket. They don't have a multi-subscription option. So, you know, as as Irwan says, they have quite a bit of competition. He says, lately, it seems like a war is going on between these three food delivery services, especially between Rappi and iFood, since we receive coupons almost daily for both of them. Might be linked to the growing worker unsatisfactions mm -hmm. because of the working conditions. They were on strike for a day last week. But overall, the Brazilian market, at least here in Sao Paulo, seems pretty much locked into Rappi with no desire to share. Ah, thank you, Erwan, for sharing uh, the the on on the scene report there. That that's fascinating and uh, really shed some light on how this works uh, when when you're seeing a big company like Uber going into a market trying to get started. Buying Postmates might help them. Postmates sort of uh, did what Rappi did is doing now at the beginning. So I don't know. Maybe that that'll help them in Brazil. Uh, all right, who do we have to shout out? Well, we have three, three, three very wonderful patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Martin James, Bjorn Andre, and Tim Ashman. Let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been drawing during today's show. What have you drawn for us this Friday, Len? Well, Alyssa had mentioned uh, Avatarify, I believe it is, uh, where they showed that uh, Elon Musk uh, Zoom bomb, fake, deep fake Zoom bomb that happened. And that was where this comes from. Uh, this is a deep fake, apparently, of Elon Musk. Uh, and two people are saying, oh, you know, that deep fake is really convincing. And the person's saying, eh, actually, I think that's real Elon Musk. Uh, he's it's hard to tell. <laughs> says, exactly. He's, he's, uh, Elon Musk is talking about colonizing Mars and selling cyber trucks to uh, Martians and Kanye 2020. Uh, it's going to be hard uh, to tell <laughs> uh, who's really telling the truth here. And uh, that's what this one's called. Deep fake Elon is right now. It's available at my Patreon, oh. patreon.com forward slash Len. Also uh, at my online store, which is lenperaltastore.com, where you can also find, um, uh, I'm drawing Animal Crossing avatars for people. So check that out when you go visit lenperaltastore.com. Excellent, Len. Also, thanks to Alyssa Miller for being with us today. Alyssa, such a pleasure. I know you keep pretty busy, so let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Yeah, so uh, you keep up with my work. Uh, either follow me on Twitter, Alyssa M underscore Infosec, or you can go to my website, www.alyssasec.com. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, check out my podcast as well. I work with William Mastagi and uh, Philip Wiley. We host The Uncommon Journey on ITSP Magazine. So always great guests there as well. Uh, love to have you check us out. Very cool. Also, thanks to Shannon Morse. Shannon, you're also pretty busy. <laughs> Let folks know where is the best place to keep up with you. Uh, as always, youtube.com slash Shannon Morse is where you can see all my newest videos, including my recent OnePlus 8 and 8 Pro reviews. I went really in depth, played with both of them for like a month each. So I had tons of fun reviewing those. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe and follow Daily Tech News Show on Instagram and Twitter. I've been posting on those two pages pretty much every day on social media. And that will keep you up to date with any kind of interesting things that are happening with Daily Tech News Show, including merch announcements and uh, weekly announcements like Security Week that we just did this week. 
Yeah. If you're like, I used to follow those when Tom ran the account, uh, it was pretty boring. You're missing a lot of fun. Shannon has done a great job with those accounts. So go check them out. It's Daily Tech News shh, on Twitter uh, and DTNS Picks on Instagram. It's re really a lot, lot of fun. Uh, thank you, Shannon, for, for making those so good. Have you ever heard the phrase machine learning? We were talking about GANs early, generative adversarial networks. Uh, if you wonder what the heck any of that actually means, well, if you have 10 minutes, I'll explain it to you on the latest episode of Know a Little More. Uh, it's in your Patreon feed at patreon.com slash DTNS, so just check it out there, or available to everyone at knowalittlemore.com. Our email address for this show is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, and we love hearing from you, so keep them coming. We're also live Monday through Friday. Please join us if you can. That's 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. See you back here on Monday. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>